a special guest that we have. I think I've mentioned this a little bit over the last couple of weeks at different times, but um, we, had a, we had a workshop yesterday on, on prayer, learning how to hear God and then pray for people in response to what we feel like God is speaking to us. And it was training for the people that pray with you every Sunday down front here, but we left it open to the whole church and uh, we had a great um, a time getting to know a little bit better Angela Chadwick. Come on out, Angela. Um, and um, you can uh, um, get, give her a hand while she comes out, even though you don't know her yet. Yes, it's good to Hi. see you. <laughs> um, many of you know Alpha. We've been doing Alpha in our church for years. And uh, she leads the national and the international, their whole prayer uh, initiative. She's the director of their prayer for their ministry, which is in all kinds of countries all around the world. It's been, been just a blessed ministry for decades, originally from Texas, and then was over in, uh, yeah. in the London area for college. Yeah, there's a few longhorns <laughs> around here, but anyway. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, married a Brit, lived over there for a while, now lives in California, Woo, where I came yeah. from. Okay, we well, at least get it in there. Uh, but most importantly about her is, listen, she leads their entire ministry around the world in prayer. And I said, would you come and speak to us this morning as we're talking about false God and, and the misinterpretations, misunderstandings that we have of God's identity. And so she's going to tackle one that's near and dear to her heart today that we sometimes think God doesn't hear us or listen to us or answer our prayers. And that's not true. So thank you, Angela, for tackling yeah. that today. Yeah. Give her a hand one more time, would you? Thank, thank you. you. For uh, can I pray real quick? Um, Jesus, we just welcome you here right now. And we want to hear your voice today speaking to us. Thank you that you are always speaking. And we just want to tune our ear to hear what it is you have to say. And I just want to pray for myself that um, anything that's not of you would just fall away and people wouldn't hear that. And But the things that are of you, Lord, that we would receive them and cherish them and feast on them today. So we welcome you, Lord here. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, yeah, you heard I'm from Texas. You can take the girl out of Texas, but you can't take the Texas out of the girl. Um, I, yeah, I grew up in Texas and um, have lived multiple places. I lived in uh, London for a while. That's where I met my husband, and that's where I started working for Alpha. And I lived in New York City a couple years, and now we've been in L.A. since 2011. And I've got Eloise, my daughter, is uh, 10, and my son Richard is 8, and so I saw a lot of parents coming in today, so we're right in the thick of life, just like you. Um, I, it's, Alpha is amazing, and I'm not going to talk a whole lot about Alpha today, um, but what I will say is it's a, it's a course designed for people who wouldn't call themselves Christians and it's an opportunity for them to come and explore the Christian faith in a non-threatening environment. And it runs in 169 countries around the world. It's been translated into 112 languages, and over 30 million people now have been through Alpha worldwide. And so I get this privilege of hearing story after story after story of people all over the world encountering Jesus and their lives being totally transformed. And it is, it is extraordinary. And it came out of this church in London, you know, this tiny little place. And you, why would a church in London be able to reach people in Ghana or in the underground church in China or in Iran? It doesn't make any sense. The only way it makes sense is the engine behind Alpha is prayer and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that it doesn't have to do with the people or the founders. It has to do with the work of God. And that is what has spread this all over the world. And so I'd love to talk a little bit about prayer. And this false statement God doesn't listen to me or answer my prayers. Maybe you're like me and you have said this before. Or felt, or at least maybe if you didn't articulate it, maybe you thought it. And in, now with my job title being prayer, um, I get people talking to me a lot of time about this. You know, God doesn't listen to me. He doesn't, you know, I, I don't see my prayers answered in the way that I hoped. Or I'm not very good at prayer. I hear that one a lot. And... 
you know, in this culture, in this life, like sometimes we can think about prayer in terms of prayer activity. You know, it's a certain way or a certain time or a certain place. Or we could think about it like a vending machine, like, well, I went and I asked and I didn't get what I wanted. Or like Amazon overnight delivery services, which I'm really thankful they're doing that now. But that's not how this works. And prayer is really all about an ongoing personal relationship with our loving Heavenly Father. That is what prayer is all about. Can we move to that slide? <laughs> or is it stuck? There we go. Um, this is what prayer is all about. It's about us showing up with the Lord as our true selves, baggage and all. I always say I show up with my full self, all my crap, and the Lord shows up as his true self. And in that place, we have a relationship. And it's very intimate. We were talking about this yesterday. Um, prayer is very intimate because the Lord, more than anybody else, knows us. And we're not always used to somebody knowing all the pieces of our lives, right? I'm going to share with you some pieces of my life, but you don't know everything. But the Lord knows everything about us and loves us unconditionally. So it's this intimate relationship. So I want to look at what is the Father, what is Jesus, and what is the Holy Spirit in terms of prayer. And so first, the Father calls us to his heart. And if you want, I'm going to be going through a lot of scripture today. So if you have a Bible or if the Bible's on your phone, you can follow along, but it'll also be on the screen. But in Matthew 27, this is when Jesus has died on the cross. And back then, the temple is where people came for the presence of God. And in the center of the temple was this little spot where God's presence was. And only the highest high priest could go into this inner place, this holy place. And it was only once a year. That was the only time anybody could be that intimately in the presence of God. So when Jesus died on the cross, you may have read this, there was a curtain that separated this inner part of the temple from the rest of the church, from the rest of the, the temple. And that curtain was torn into two. It says, Matthew 27, 51, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, what did that mean? Why is it when Jesus died on the cross, why did that temple curtain get torn? The Father was drawing us to his heart. He was saying, I don't want this intimate place to be only for one person one time a year. I want this intimate place to be for all of us, for everyone. I want every single person in this room to be able to come into my presence. And Jesus made that possible for us. No longer, there was like a whole ritual that the high priest had to go through to get to that place in order to be cleansed and holy. And Jesus covered all of that. The Father wants you and you and you and you and you. He wants you in this intimate relationship. Okay, so the Father calls us to his heart. And Jesus wants us to come to him, as I was saying, as we are. And have, are you like me? I've grown up in church, and I could sometimes think there's a certain posture or mindset I need to have before I enter this room. Do you ever feel like that? It's like, uh, I don't know if they'll want me to show up today, or I don't know if I'm really in the mood. I'm not feeling happy, clappy, ready to worship today, right? But Jesus says, no, I just want you to come where you're at. And so I'm gonna, I want to look at a few scriptures here. Um, so you have to bear with me. So Matthew 3, verses 5 through 6. This is when John the Baptist was baptizing people. People went out to John the Baptist from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins 
they were baptized by him in the Jordan. So just imagine this for a moment. Here's this prophet in the middle of the desert, right? And people are coming from all the villages, all the towns, all over. And what are they doing? They're confessing their sins. And if I really sat and imagined, like, I bet there were some pretty, pretty big sins that were being confessed, right, back in that day and age. But all of them are coming down to confess their sins and be baptized in the Jordan River. And then, starting at verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I mean, he's really bad at these guys. <laughs> he's talking very strong. And I want to talk about what's happening here. I was reading this passage the other day, and I was like, Whoa, John the Baptist, like what is going on? You got really mad really quickly. And I realized as I'm reading this, when the Pharisees and Sadducees came, they did not come confessing, and they did not come to be baptized. So imagine, imagine all of us in here confessing our deepest sins and coming to the Lord. And then imagine a group of people who are meant to be church leaders coming in and standing on the side and just watching, observing, not entering in. And this is what gets John the Baptist so upset. He's saying, look, I mean, all these people, it didn't matter what their sins were, they were coming to the Lord. But here are these people who are meant to be the leaders and they're saying, we don't need to enter in. And so John the Baptist calls him out. He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The fruit of our lives comes when we say, I don't have it, Lord, but you do. I don't got this. And they were sitting there saying, we have all the answers. We've got this. Or they, uh, he says, you know, and do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Almost like It's almost like saying, well, if we were to say that now, it's like, well, I'm a Christian, so I'm exempt. I don't have to ask for forgiveness. Like, that's kind of the posture that they were coming in at. So, this is what's happening. But then, so the only, let me just move on here. The only sin that gets called out in this moment, imagine what all the sins that are being confessed. The only sin that gets called out is not coming to God. That's the only sin. It's the only thing that says, you know what, that's not okay. It doesn't matter if somebody came confessing adultery or theft or murder. It didn't matter. The only thing that gets called out is, you didn't come to me. And we see this all the time in the scriptures, but Jesus upholds the humble and he resists the proud. And I don't know about you, my favorite leaders are those that are humble and vulnerable, but it's really hard <laughs> to be a humble, vulnerable leader because it means sharing all my crap with you <laughs> and showing that I'm broken. And in our culture, we want to be strong. And I don't want you to think that I'm weak. I want you to think that I'm strong. But God upholds the humble. He loves it when we say, you know what? I don't have this, but the Lord does. Okay, and then I love how Jesus just transforms this whole moment. Because here's all these people, they're probably feeling guilt and shame because they've been confessing and here's the religious leaders not participating. And Jesus comes down and he comes from Galilee to the Jordan. This is starting at verse 13. To be baptized by John. But, I love this, but John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And maybe you sometimes feel like that, like God's calling you to something that you don't feel equipped to do. And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper 
for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. I tell you that out of these stones, God, oh, sorry, (laughs) I jumped to the wrong slide. Um, At this time, Jesus said, I praise you, oh, nope. That's where we end that, that scripture, I apologize. Um, but Jesus gets baptized after that. And the heavens open up and the father says, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus who was perfect, who did not need to be baptized for sin. He was perfect. And he goes down to be baptized to take on our sin. In that same water where all those confessions were made, He went down to take on all of that. He was affirming and saying, this is a good thing, what you all are doing. I know the Pharisees and Sadducees were making you feel guilt and shame, but I'm telling you, this is good. This is what the Lord says. So Jesus says, come to me as you are. And let me just move forward a little bit to Matthew 11 as well. And... Jesus revisits what's happening with John the Baptist and he's teaching about it. And he says to the people, he's just found out that um, John the Baptist has been arrested. And he says to people, you know, what did you go out into the desert to see? You know, you went out to see a prophet, didn't you? And he calls out the Pharisees again for their behavior. And he really gets on to them. And then he concludes this time affirming coming to the Lord. He says, This is 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. And I want to say something here about the word children, because remember when the heavens opened up, the Father said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. So he's now calling all those people who came to confess, he's calling them his kids. He's revealing himself. We are now sons and daughters. What the father was speaking over Jesus, we now also get spoken over us. You have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then he says this, which you probably have all heard. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened with your sin, with your confession, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. When we come to the Lord, he doesn't meet us with guilt and shame and judgment and stand aside and look at us like, oh, look at what you've done. When we come to Jesus, we are met with gentleness. And Jesus is calling himself humble. We're met with gentleness and humility when we come to Jesus, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus wants us to come to him as we are. And I call it the unfair exchange. When I bring to him all my stuff and in return, I get this easy, light burden. It's not even a burden. He calls it a burden, but it doesn't even feel, it's just, I get everything that he has promised. I get joy and love and patience and kindness and all the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And he gets all my crap, all the lies, all the anger, all my frustrations. And it's it's unfair. Like, I shouldn't get that in return, but that's what he promises us when we come to him. That's what he promises. And the promise is when we pray that we receive the Holy Spirit. Because what I was just naming, all that fruit, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And when, Jesus, when the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray, 
um, he has this four-part response in Luke 11. And the first part of his response is the Lord's Prayer. It's kind of a pattern of prayer that we can practice. I was telling the guys yesterday, all prayer begins in the flesh. You're not filled with the Holy Spirit when you start to pray. Like you just have to begin and usually it begins in, in brokenness. Um, but you begin to pray. And that pattern of prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is a helpful guide of, okay, how do I begin? Then he gives us a story which is um, about a guy who shows up at his friend's house at midnight and he says, hey, I've got another friend who's in town and I don't have any food to give him. Can I borrow some bread? And the friend that's been woken up is like, no, you know, I've been asleep. My kids are in bed. Like, I'm not gonna get you up and give you anything. And Jesus says, because of, it's not because they're friends. It's because of the man's boldness that I will get up and give you whatever you need. So he's saying something about prayer. There's something about boldness, coming to the Lord boldly and asking him for things. And then there's this promise that he gives us. I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Well, what is he promising exactly here? And that's the last part of his teaching. Sorry, move that away a little bit. Um, That's the last part of his teaching is, he says, who of you who are fathers will give your kid, you know, a scorpion when they ask you for an egg? And he said, you though you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your kids then how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So when Jesus' four-part response to teach us to pray, he's saying, you wanna learn to pray like me? I pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how I pray. And that's the promise that we have when we come to him, that we receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, I wanna tell my story really quickly. Um, a real life example of everything I've just taught. So I was in a personal time of prayer and I've been doing this thing where I try to pray before I read the Bible because I was finding that just reading the Bible on its own became this intellectual exercise and I was just getting caught up in, I don't know, I just, it, it wasn't centered around the Lord. I was trying to be more vulnerable with the Lord. So I got on my knees and I began to pray And this is, you'll have to bear with me. The Lord speaks to me in pictures. So this is how our interactions go. And I was kneeling down and he said to me, I want you to draw a jar and I want you to fill it with all the lies that you've been believing. So to be honest, this really was not hard for me. So I I sat down, I had my journal, I drew like a mason jar And I started to write all the lies that I was believing. You know, you're not cut out to do this job, or you're fat, or you're not smart enough, or, you know, all the things. It really was not hard, and I had quite a few in there. And after I did that, I knew what I needed to do was hand that jar over to the Lord. So I prayed a very sincere prayer, and I just said, I'm so sorry, Lord that I believed these lies. And I was crying, which I cry a lot. Um, I was crying, I'm so sorry that I believed these lies because they've caused me to sin and not understand who you really are. And I just give them to you. And then we just kind of sat there and I said to the Lord, well, what are you gonna do with my jar? (laughs) And he was kind of playful back and he said, well, I could um, pick it up and smash it on the ground. And I was like, yeah, you could. And he said, or I could put it in my mouth and swallow it. I was like, yeah, you could, but what are you gonna do with my jar? And then I saw him pour this hot gold liquid into the jar. And I said, what's that, Lord? And he goes, that's my love for you. 
And so I wrote, I drew another mason jar and did this hot gold liquid and I wrote God's hot love for me. <laughs> um, and then I saw him put a wick in it. And I said, well, what's that, Lord? And he says, that's when you worship me from deep inside your heart. And so at this point, I'm like, okay, I know that this is a candle. So I, I drew a flame. And of course, that's the Holy Spirit lighting my prayers. And at this point, this, I'm just thanking the Lord. What a beautiful picture. And so now I'm like, okay, the Holy Spirit's definitely here. I can read the word of God now. <laughs> and so I open up to Exodus. I was reading Exodus chapter 16 that day. And I was in the whole book. And you'll know the story. It's the story of they've, um, the Israelites have escaped out of Egypt. They're now in the desert. And they have no food or anything like that. And they're complaining. They're complaining to the Lord that they don't have, um, that it would be better if they remained slaves. Because at least there they had something to fill their bellies. And Moses says to them, hold on, like, um, you know, you're not complaining to me. You're complaining to the Lord. But Moses takes this to the Lord. And in response, he gives them manna from heaven and quail. And so it gets to this point at the end of Exodus. Uh, so this is chapter 16, start at verse 32. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so that they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar. And at this point, my jaw dropped. And I went, a jar? Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it. Then place it before the Lord to be kept for generations to come. And I went back and re-looked at the story again. The Israelites were believing a lie that God had brought them out of Egypt to let them starve and die. And when they brought to the Lord the lie that they were believing, he poured out manna. He poured out his love onto them. He didn't reprimand them for the lie. They came to him. And he poured out his love. And all he asked in return was that they save it and remember it and worship God forever with that, for the generations to come. And at this point, I am just weeping. Like, we have a God that says, your lies, when you bring them to me, it's beautiful worship. And I will fill you with love. I'm like, that is pretty pitiful worship, Lord. <laughs> you want me to bring my lies to you? <laughs> That's pretty pitiful. And you're going to meet me by pouring love on me. I mean, that's a God I will follow forever. I will serve you forever, Lord, if that's how you reply to my brokenness. I told you I'd cry. So God doesn't listen to me or answer my prayers is a lie. He loves us. And he doesn't, he's not surprised by our sin. That's why he sent Jesus. And we can just come to him. Um, so I would love to pray and just invite him to come and meet us where we're at right now. If you want to stand. I'd love to invite the worship team and the prayer team up too. Um, we have an amazing God. And so I just want, I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit. And you don't have to do this, but if you want to, you could put your hands out and close your eyes. It's like, it's just the opposite of this, right? It's just saying, okay, Lord, like I want what you have for me. Um, and we're just going to welcome him and just let him, I'm going to stop speaking. I'm going to be quiet.
And I've even asked the worship team not to play um, so that we can just hear what God has to say to us. We're gonna hand him the microphone. So Lord, we thank you that you pour out your love on us when we come to you. And so we just invite you right now, come Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's what he says. If the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you, and if that even sounds strange, me saying that, it's just, if you've been feeling something, maybe you haven't felt before, or you've been thinking about things that you haven't thought about, or you've been feeling something in your body, um, we would love to pray for you. And we've got a prayer team down here of people who would love to pray and just allow you and the Lord to meet together today. So I just wanna, the worship team's gonna play a little bit right now, but if you want to come and receive prayer, we would love to pray for you. And I don't know how often you guys do this, so if this feels vulnerable, it is a little vulnerable. Um, but it, you know, that's okay. It's okay, it's safe. I promise the prayer team doesn't bite. <laughs> if you're feeling weary today, burdened, um, you have something in life that you feel like, we just can't figure this out, just come. There are people, they would love to pray with you. Nobody's going to be shocked about anything. is here that knows how to pray for people. I know we're having people come up and if you want to come and pray, 